You are listening to the Bravo Creative Podcast, hosted by Tom Baker. Thank you for listening. Your position has been triangulated. Drone army has been dispatched to your location. Commencing attack run in 3, 2, 1. Hello and welcome to the Bravo Creative Podcast and thank you so dang much for listening. We've got a great show for you today, but first, the Bravo Creative Podcast is being delivered to you by way of all of your favorite podcast platforms and it is linked directly from www.bravocreative.net slash bravo podcast. On a side note, I'm about 20 listens shy of the official 2000 mark of podcast listens and let me just say that I'm kind of excited about it and I want to thank each and every one of my listeners for making that happen and thank you for hanging in with the very abbreviated schedule as of late that brings me into my next subject I know it has been a few weeks since the last podcast but let me give you my excuse um I have for lack of a better word, I've been drinking from a fire hose for about a month, but it got really crazy the last couple of weeks. Um, I've been putting the finishing touches on a couple of very big projects, and I also had the theatric run of Mamma Mia down in Branson at the historic Owen Theater, which was an absolutely amazing experience, and I am so very thankful to have had that opportunity. And I'll talk more about it, the production and just kind of the the people that I met and very talented folks um, as I progress down the road. But as of right now, I kind of have some post-show blues. And that's merely just from not having that crazy endorphin rush every evening and also not being able to see um, the great friends that I made along the way. But... We sold out all eight performances, and we had a blast doing the show, and I'm also starting on a few new projects now, and it has made this podcasting experience harder, and I'm constantly needing to update this process. Being a one-man show, it takes a lot of adjustment, so I apologize for the lack of content as of recent, but the plus side is that I have, in all of this rigmarole that I just went through, I have met some very extremely talented folks in the process, and so I hope to be able to get them onto the show and have you find out more about them. This episode of the Bravo Creative Podcast is officially sponsored by Do More Films, which if you don't know what Do More Films is, Do More Films is Ducon Williams, the producer, director, and lead actor of Vincent's Vow. And he's going to be on the show today. He has, he's going to talk a little bit about Vincent's Vow and some new developments that are happening with it. And he has also got a new and exciting production that he is getting ready to undertake. So we'll be talking to him about that in a few minutes. This episode was pre-recorded about a week ago. And since then, We've had some great news come out. Dukon's film, Vincent's Vow, uh, they signed on with a distributor for the feature film. There's some really cool things that are going to be happening with that. So a big congratulations to all of those involved in the film. Also, past guest Val Bates, her project Finding Joy was totally funded. So congratulations, Val and the crew of Finding Joy. And lastly, Eldritch USA started film production this last week with our guest David Watson, who is the cinematographer extraordinaire on that. So lots of great things are happening in the 417. Now, let's get to our guest today. Both of these guys are so very talented, and they're so much fun to talk with, and I absolutely love having them on the show. I want to welcome to the mics, Ducon Williams and David Watson. And so before we begin, like I said, This episode was already recorded, and because we just started recording the show, there's no way to hide the cut, so we'll just cut straight into the action, and we begin our podcast with the very important and very often overlooked Mm pre-production. I cannot stress how important pre-production is. 
part of the reason why I've been up for the last 72 hours straight working is because there was a lack of pre-production. Um, we were just actually having a conversation about pre-production is that what saves you 20 seconds in pre-production or production will cost you two to three hours in post-production. Would you guys agree on that? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm a living witness. I've experienced it multiple times. <laughs> and part of today is actually a little bit of pre-production for you, correct? It is, actually. Yes. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, in fact, uh, the biggest thing I wanted to, to mention is that since making Vincent's Vow, when I told myself if I ever make another feature film, my focus is going to allow a lot more time for pre-production because um, I allowed about a month of pre-production when I did Vincent's Vow, which led to a year of post-production. Yeah. And uh, I aim to change that this time around. I think what people don't realize about pre-production is the, the production is exciting. The whole production process is exciting. But if you don't do in a lot enough time in pre-production, um, if you a lot more time in pre-production, production problems will take care of themselves and post-production problems will take care of themselves. And so it's kind of like this. You've got to basically curb your excitement of production. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because you will pay with blood in post. I was not slitting my wrist during post, but I know what you mean. Yeah. You will yeah. pay with blood. <laughs> there will be blood. There will be blood, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. That was David. David that introduced yeah. that to me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. I, I actually, that's the movie. I, every now and then I get hung up on a movie. That's the one I've been watching here me lately. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. There will be blood. That's excellent. Mm. I'm drinking your milkshake from right over here. <laughs> I drink your milkshake. This just got morbid, folks. It did. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> well, okay, so let's talk about this. You just brought up Vincent's Vow. How is Vincent's Vow? Kind of what is the status of Vincent's Vow? You've had the premiere. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, absolutely, absolute uh, uh, amazing experience. January 15th of this year, we had a premiere where a lot of the cast and crew got to come and see it for the first time. Um, loved it. And, and, uh, we did a second showing based off of the results of that. That was also really, really good. And, um, ultimately, ultimately it led to quite a few discussions with different distributors. I think I've settled on one. We had a distributor contact us that, uh, wants Vincent's foul. They are being kind enough to make an offer that they will take care of distribution, try to get it to the foreign market and the domestic market, and that they will take care of all like DVD, Blu-ray sales and digital sales, but they'll still allow me to have control of sales personally as well. So I can still sell copies on the Vincent's Val website, digital copies, Blu-rays, DVDs, and can set up my own theatrical and church showings as well. That's awesome. And they are, they're not tying my hands at all. That is awesome. It's fantastic. And on top of that, uh, they have two different options. It can be a 50-50 split between the distribution company and the film company on the revenues if uh, they pay for everything up front. But if I choose the option, I can get 65% for the film company to their 35% if they get to take the first 12500 of revenue to cover their costs. Oh, I see. So, so there's a couple different options there, and uh, just visiting with the so acquisition. So, if the film makes money, yes, then the, actually the sixty thirty is a pretty good is a pretty good deal. Then it is. It is for only twelve and a half thousand revenue that the distribution company is asking for before that split. Um, that's actually pretty good, assuming that the film will do well. Right. And a lot of that depends on the filmmaker because they send out what is called a deliverables list. And a lot of that is like um, having your closed captioning file, having separate music and sound effects tracks. And what that enables them to do. So basically. Oh, and a, and a script exactly as it's edited. And so doing labels. a bonafide like sound mastering on it. Yes, which we've already done. You already did that. Uh, the great Kong Taulio, as I call him, <laughs> right, uh, helped me get that done. 
and I knew it was something that needed done. The Bobby acquisitions, Kong. Bobby, Bobby Kong, Kong. yes, Bobby Kong. The, the clipboard thrower. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to watch myself around the great Bobby Kong Holio. I, I did get to throw a clipboard in one of those did videos. You? I did. I helped him shoot one. I got to See, throw it. <laughs> David Watson is also a, a fantastic is. behind the scenes production <laughs> assistant. <laughs> if you ever need a clipboard thrown, he can hit Kong straight in the face. Can do it. So anyway, back to back to what I was saying about deliverables. Um, here in October is the Cannes Film Festival over in France. And the acquisitions representative tells me that the foreign market over there is huge. And they're, they're looking to buy films. And so if, if uh, we sign the deal, provide them with a list of the deliverables to where they have a script that, say, the country of Estonia, for lack of a better word, wants to buy it and play it in their country, they have a script that they can have actors come in and read in their own language to dub it. And therefore, therefore it makes it to where your market is expanding. And, and so I'm trying to do that, make sure that we have all that in place because really, even though you get a distributor, how well that distributor does worldwide still depends on the filmmaker, right? Getting all those deliverables available. Mm -hmm. So my job isn't finished at all. Um, and in November is the American film market where, they right. basically rent a gigantic hotel, take out all the beds and all these different distribution and companies put, set up office for a week in a, a giant hotel. That's cool. And then all these people go in and, and look at what films are available. Wow. So th that's October and November of this year. So we're really looking forward to just getting the deal signed and getting the deliverables to the, the distributor because that will maximize the performance that it does in the market. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, really exciting. Anyway, we've had six different distributors that we've talked to, and I think I finally settled on one. So this was the best deal, and uh, the guy was the sweetest guy I think I've ever talked to. Well, that's cool. So, yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah, it's, nice. it's, it's excellent. This is exciting. good news. Yes. It's really good news. Congratulations. Hey, thank you. Congratulations to you guys. You were part of it. <laughs> yeah. I was, we were. I was, we the, were. I was the pawn store guy. <laughs> we were. I love it. It was cut out of the film. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're in it. You just don't I am. Have your, I'm in the background. Your yeah. dialogue is yeah. goes right. Yeah, I'm in the yeah. background. Hey, yeah. you know that's a that's a very cherished deleted scene of mine, <laughs> actually. And in fact, when I need a good laugh, I sometimes pull not not in a bad way. Right. It's it's uh it's not that Tom did a bad job. It's not a mocking laugh. It's it's that he did so good with this angry pawn owner. Did, dude, I remember it. It's almost inspired me to write a script based off his performance. Yeah, wouldn't that be funny? He's like, <laughs> Vincent's about the sequel, and it's just the pawn store guy in yeah. the back. No, like, yeah. Where did this guy come from? Go, no, he was in that scene right there. Yeah, <laughs> yep, absolutely. He uh, didn't know anything about love, and that's why he's so angry. Is there going to be a Vincent's Val 2? I hope not. <laughs> I, I hope it le uh, left on a good note. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dude, that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> uh, Please, God, no. Well, I, I mean. I'm joking. Uh, and and Dale, uh, David nailed it. If if I feel like God wants me to do it, I'll do it. But mm -hmm. um, I hope that that was just a good conclusion to the story because I wouldn't know where to take it from there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just I, wouldn't. I, yeah, I. It's kind of like there was enough finality at the end of that one yeah. that it was kind of like okay, yeah, we can. Which we got a great response in in Branson, um, a public showing in Branson. Then there was uh, a man and his wife from Hawaii, who throughout the film had audible gasps at certain oh, really? moments in the film. And, and as a filmmaker, I'm sitting in the back just welling up with gratitude because we're getting responses right. to these things that I didn't know if they'd work. And uh, that lady come up to me after the, the showing, and she says, I am the biggest fan of happy endings, and I have never seen a happier ending to a movie in my life. That's awesome. So oh, wow. that, was, awesome. that was a very <laughs> nice moment <laughs> for me and Mike, nice. who were both there. So. so whenever you start thinking about like everything now, that like the post-production, because kind of like what we were talking about, this mm -hmm. distribution is a huge part of it that I think a lot of us around here, when we're looking at, you know... Um, micro budget films short films and independent films we don't really look at distribution at all we don't really put that into the mix of hey this is something that we re we need to keep an eye on this mm -hmm. um how is how has your mind been changed with this 
what are th- what were what were things you didn't know you didn't know oh boy that's a great question well um <clears throat> i'm gonna be i'm gonna be right honest with you that i once put on a lab suit and uh painted a stick with like black and yellow stripes because i was going to do an experiment and uh really hazardous experiment and i realized that when i picked up one end of the stick the other end came up with it now let me explain what i mean by that (laughs) very very strange but my point is is that i went into vincent's val expecting a distribution deal if you begin with the end in mind knowing that if you pick up one end of the stick the other one will come up it's a thing called faith Sure. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know as you put it. But if you, if you take that step of faith and basically say, okay, at the end of this, this will be the result, and you reinforce that throughout the process, ultimately this is what will happen. And uh, what I didn't know was the journey in between and how grueling it would be and how much tenacity would have to be applied in order to get to that other end of the stick because it was a really heavy stick. Right. So, um, but knowing ahead of time that it is a heavy stick, yes. Okay. To stay with your analogy, knowing ahead of time that's, that it's a heavy stick, even though you have that in mind, it's not going to pick itself up. Right. Like the force is not just gonna uh pick it up. So there (laughs) is, there is a, a, a healthy amount of do that has to be in there which no one is going to doubt at all that you had a healthy amount of do going on because (laughs) you literally almost killed yourself making vincent's vow yeah there was a healthy amount of do do as well so (laughs) (laughs) absolutely Uh, so but with that being said is that you have to know that there is a ton of work that has to be done in that process yeah and so Taking it one step further, what were what were some of those things that you didn't know that you were going to have to probably work on that, and and the cost that we were going to get from or that you were going to have to pay from that? If I'm understanding your your question yeah. correctly, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we already mentioned one of the biggest things, and that's pre production. Yeah, I I knew what the story was. I knew what I wanted to do with it. I didn't know that I had to communicate with everybody way ahead of time in order to get us all on the same page. So on production, uh, the shoot days, a lot of times there were a lot of questions being asked me that I thought were no brainers, but of course they're going to be no brainers because I didn't tell anybody what I was looking for. Right. Um, and, and so God bless David and, and Mike and some of these guys that had to pick up the slack for my lack of communication, but I didn't know that I had to do a lot of communicating. Right. Now I do. And that's going to well, be a huge advantage. And that brings up David. So, how long before Vincent's foul did you? When did you come on board? How far before filming? When did you come on board? Well, I had. Uh, how long before did we do the proof of concept? We shot a six months before. Six months. So that we started production. Yeah. So we we did that. So I I shot the proof of concept trailer. Um, so I and I I remember <laughs> we tested the red like. <laughs> Boy, how much but were you about? officially going to be filming the film when you did the proof of no. concept? So you weren't like 100% right. invested in the project mentally at no. that point. No. I was just there to help. So help when did you actually like mentally get checked into Vincent's vow? Gosh, I don't even know how soon it was. It feels like it was earlier than six months. But maybe uh, I, not. Think, I think if I remember right, it was two months before okay. we started months, shooting. Yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. think that two months from a visual, like, you know, when, you, when you're building a story or building an idea in your head, like somebody comes up to you, go, hey, David, I got a project for this, mm-hmm. right? Like, for example, you're, you're doing, um, you've been on Eldritch, you're going to be filming that. You've been cooking on Eldritch for about a year, yeah, right? At least. Like thinking about it. Right. Um, you've got Val's film that you're probably cooking on that one too right. as well. So there's a lot of pre-prep that I think people don't realize as far as on that pre-production side that it helps to start pre-production early because that only helps your creatives and your people that are working on it to go okay i don't know how to do this yet but i've got time to figure it out because there's a lot of brain work that goes into that process you know if you're going to allow 
those different segments of mm-hmm. production happen and happen efficiently is like David knows, okay, I know on this film, I got to have a gimbal or I got to yeah. have a this or I got to have a that or I need, I'm going to have to have a couple other shooters because there's mm-hmm. no way to pull off these shots the way we're mm-hmm. wanting to or right. to get the coverage. So the more time you have in that, would you agree is? Oh, yeah. I mean, one thing that does help, um, and, and it's we're all three of those that we're talking about those films, like I've done proof of concept trailers for. So visually, as far as like, what do we want the movie to look like? We've kind of already established that. Yeah. And most of it, like, like Dukon's was, you know, uh, Vince's Val was pretty normal. There wasn't anything crazy about it. You know, I don't think anything we're doing is really crazy. Any of these. Um um, Eldritch might be a little bit crazier than normal, but um, but at least we've got an idea like what what it needs to look like. But you're definitely right. Like one of the big things is you know figuring out like what gear we're going to need. Like and even one thing Dukon Dukon and I've been talking about for for future films like what camera we're going to use. Like are we going to try to do this or that? Um, I've shot enough now that like I have an idea of what kind of works and what doesn't and that kind of stuff. And so that's a, that's a big one too, is figuring that kind of thing out. And, and then budget, like what can you even afford? And of course I've mm-hmm. got a lot of gear, but there's still stuff that would be nice to have, It'd be nice to have some more powerful lights and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So that's always things to be thinking about. Um, and then, you know, like even like happy Halloween is one that they're trying to still get off the ground, but you know, that's a very different, like, cause a lot of it's at night, a lot of it's like in a, corn maze and this crazy colors and all this kind of stuff and how are you going to light this corn maze and all that kind of, you know but again i did a, a proof of concept for it and i have at least i i did that one with no electricity it was all batteries right mm-hmm. so we managed to pull it off so but any the i mean i think any time with anything more time is better than less time and, oh yeah and and being yeah. working closely with the director is you know being familiar with the script being working with the director and like again, having done those proof of concept helps a ton because you you know the script, you know how they kind of want to look like it, look, want it to look like, and even with you know finding joy with uh, Val's project, like getting you know, which is currently in the funding stage right is, now. It, so if anybody, I'll yes. put a link out there if anybody wants to, uh, and I encourage everyone to go out there. And I think the lowest you can give is fifteen, but that would help them like, immensely yeah, and a ton. It probably puts money in david's pocket which is hopefully is rightly deserved yeah. right so maybe and those are good things yes it is and but valerie told me just this morning it's 46 percent funded right now yeah it's yeah so i was so looking at it this morning fantastic she actually progress. she texted me last night let me read it this <laughs> okay. is kind of funny she texted me last we night. we love you valerie <laughs> and she said hey tom have you had a chance to check out the finding joy campaign yet if you scroll down on the main page you'll see a shout out to you and a link to our podcast so thank you val nice. that was sweet that's awesome nice. very nice. cool but one one thing on 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 hers that she was really great about and it helps me because it's all obviously visual is what i'm worried about and it's like she she did a great job i mean we had we've talked a ton but she had a couple of emails to me that she had literally time stamps from tv shows or movies yeah there was a couple shots that she really liked like sort of interesting things that were done and it that kind of stuff is like, I need to know those things. Like we've tested a couple of them. Can we pull this mm-hmm. off? One of them is like ro- literally rolling the camera. Yeah. And so we, I tested that. And so that's a big part of it too. If you you know, you just think, oh, we'll do it. But what if it's something you've, like you said, you've never done or you don't know if you can do it because we don't have, you know, we don't run Hollywood productions yeah. and we don't always have access to that stuff. And so, and even, you know, a lot of it was examples of shots or scenes or a lot of it was just, this is kind of how I like this look, something similar to this. I mean, you know, I don't even feel bad about doing that stuff because there's really no originality. There's, you know, everything's kind steel, of been steel, done. Steel, steel, right. steel. Uh-huh. You th- I mean, you hear it all the time about, you know, big time productions. They'll, you know, they'll send out a list of movies to watch. You know, still, I think Spielberg and those guys, they do like watch these, watch the Maltese Falcon or watch mm-hmm. whatever, like these are, you know, we all draw inspiration from things. And so, oh, sure. but that's, that helps me and my mind start to like, okay, well, it's going to be this kind of lighting. It's going to be dark and dreary and it's going to be like right. spooky and, or it's going to be really bright. And well, know, and so. I think originality in general comes from the story. Mm-hmm. I mean, Definitely. that's where so you're going to, if you're worried about originality, originality is in before you even get into the, the pre-production phase, mm-hmm. it's in the story of what you can do with it and where you can take, the the reader yeah. 
and you know it and Val is doing a great job by the way on pre-production because she's been working on it for a while and I just talking with her and how she has everything locked in is really good that is good Mm -hmm. good example but um so you are working on another project yes and can you talk about that a little bit i can i can so um it is called duel of justice but not like a a d-u-e-l duel where you pull out swords and and fight it's uh or or it's more of a dual personality d-u-a-l or are the personalities dueling that's that happens too (laughs) that happens too it's um and i don't want to spoil it because if i went too much into the story then um uh yeah you wouldn't have this neat Mm -hmm. experience when we show it in theaters but uh basically it's a period piece it's a western and it really tackles uh the subject of truth and justice and one thing i'll say about it is that um in the vein of show don't tell something my dad's been preaching a lot to me um is that i want to show a lot of this truth and justice concept and when you're using things visually to tell your story it becomes very very important that you be on the same page with the dp he needs to be as much part of the storytelling process as the director in that sense and so um David and I have actually been working on this, and one of our pr- approaches, because of pre-production being so important to me, was I get these little fantasies of shots I want to do. But until, unless you test them, you could be wasting an entire day or more That's right. on your production, spending money, and find out it doesn't wasting work. Wasting a day isn't the worst part. It's the money that Absolutely. gets involved in it. <laughs> Absolutely. And so we've discussed, we've discussed shooting a couple micro shorts where the the main goal of those shorts is to test certain shots to um, get familiar with gear that we're going to be using that we haven't used yet. Right. Um, test certain theories as far as, as far as lighting setups and different things like that and get practice with Steadicam because uh, we're going to be using that a lot. So, <laughs> and, and I'm okay with paying that kind of a price because have you seen the new me, floats, new floats? Have you seen those? Yeah. Might need to talk about those. No. Oh, okay. We need to talk about this. Okay. The All right. Well, there's something I'm not, I, I, <laughs> I might I might be willing to uh, jump in on that process. Okay. As far as figuring that out, because Fantastic. those are those are awesome. Are they? Yeah. Oh yeah. They're oh, pricey. Yeah. Sweet. They're not too bad. Okay. No, not the. Uh, I need to look at price, but I've Tilta seen Tilta makes one. If you don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about camera rig that mm-hmm. um, basically it's. It's kind of a hybrid between the old vest system for a steady cam. Uh-huh. But then what they do is they incorporate that float vest with a steady cam and a gimbal attached to it. Yeah. And so you mm-hmm. have the biggest problem you have with a steady like a gimbal is you have the the up and down bounce uh-huh. when you're moving. What the steady cam and the float system does is it basically just kind of eliminates that that bounce. Oh, okay. The nice thing about it is, is you don't have to have a tripod with you for a certain days of filming. You can go, all right, we're going to do handheld on this whole day. Yeah. And you're just wow. basically swapping off and you're just using a focus pull. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Actually. And the reason why they're, well, uh, 1917, the Sam Mendes film, yep. 1917, mm-hmm. a lot of it was filmed with this uh, RE, I forget what they call that thing. I don't know if it was the RELF, like the large format. No, they used the small format camera, okay. but it was the RE vest system. Oh, yeah. And it has this really like long. Boom yeah, almost. it was like a boom arm, and they could move this camera all over the place. And oh, they wow. could do all kinds of stuff that you can. It's a, a hybrid of the steady cam because the steady cam sure. looks okay. better. I mean, hands down, a good steady cam operator, their stuff is right. phenomenal. Yeah. But. The, the the smoothness of the gimbal is kind of unattainable sometimes on a steady cam. Sure. And these are able to run fairly heavy systems too. Mm-hmm. When we're talking probably what, ten pounds to thirteen pounds. And that's what I want to use. Yeah. Can we get that RE stuff? We can. I, I yeah. mean I, I would love to use it. Yeah. <laughs> RE. No 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 problem, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean really the the thing is is like to me I think to to diverge a little bit 
one of the things that was the nicest about Vincent's vow and I sat and tried to figure it out, you know, we've talked about fall off and all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. Mm. It's cause it's a global shutter. A global shutter makes so much difference on a camera. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, just the look of a global shutter, you can see a camera that shoots with a global shutter and you're like, Oh yeah, that's global shutter. It's, it look it looks it, more filmic, right? right. Because it, is that what the, is that the term? Because I've never heard that term. Global just, shutter, yeah. yeah. It means every frame. It's a literally. Yeah, it's just like in a, a a reel of film. Gotcha. Whereas on like if you're just shooting with a regular video camera or like what we typically shoot on, right? You have your blurry frames in there, but they all those are those are made by the software. Those are not made by. Okay. So that's one of the things that, and you get a better rendition every single image that's popped out. That's why red footage is, you know, in a red format and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Makes sense. But now there's some other cameras that are cheaper that are coming out Mm -hmm. that are global shutter cameras. And so you look at it and go, well, do they have the same, you know, you're still going to have the same rendition with it. So Mm -hmm. for us indie guys. Yes. That's a good thing because now yeah, we can absolutely. produce films and we don't have to have all well, like in your case, you don't have to have a 50 pound brick on your shoulder. Yeah. 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 Which is nice. And we, and we've talked yeah, about, we've talked about these other cameras as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to go into that, David, about some of what we talked about with uh, black magic and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, like we've, I mean, they've got, I actually, I'm not even kidding you. As I was driving up here today, I was watching another video on the. On the Black, Pro? The Blackmagic Pocket 6K, the Pro. The Pro 6K. Dude, like, I mean, I've watched a couple, literally two videos today, and, they, you know, I've been trying to watch everything I can watch, and a lot of the stuff I've seen that were negatives about it is not really stuff that I care about. It doesn't affect me. One of the guys was like, it's not very ergonomical if you're carrying it. I ain't going to be carrying it. No. We're going to have it on a tripod or on a gimbal or I'm on a shoulder. I don't care about that. My issue with the Blackmagic mm-hmm. was how light it was. And this mm-hmm. new one is yeah. like, it's, uh, I think the, the 4K was... Oh, I don't know, one point something pound. This one's like almost 25% heavier. Well, because they put the whole ND filter. It's in there. In yeah. the front. Yeah. 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 Which hmm. is super and nice to and have. And it's also bigger. It's almost, mm-hmm. it's like 60% big. I don't know, anyways, I can't remember what, this, what the percentages were, but it's significantly bigger than this, than the, even than the first 6K. But you look at 6K. filming a whole film with something like that. Mm-hmm. And really the file sizes off of a black magic are smaller well and one of the things in in a ProRes format yeah yeah well here's so one thing about i did learn this today the uh, that i didn't realize the 6k pro has it 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 only records ProRes up through 4k right 5k 6k is is only b-raw is only b-raw yeah but one thing that the 6k does is you can literally can directly connect not through a atomos not through directly connect a external hard drive and record directly to the external hard drive solid state drive yeah yeah, like just boom, plug it up, and then you're you're good to go. Which is fantastic. And of course, I, you have to rig yeah. that and make that fit and all that kind of jazz. Yeah, but, mm-hmm. but it's not that. I mean, no, it's not that big a deal, and that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, and you get yeah. 3.0 transfer. You're it's like zipping it out there. My Z cam does the same thing, okay, so you can, I can plug it directly into a hard drive. Yeah. But it's it's really like I've watched a ton of stuff. Every anybody who cares about this stuff, but there's a lot. There's a bajillion videos out there on it, but it really. Everything, everybody that I've watched, people that I that I that I know are YouTubers that are doing, that know what they're talking about more, way more than I do, have tons more experience shooting on Reds and Res and stuff like that, and they just are over the moon. They they th- of all the mirrorless cameras out there now, they're that the Black Magic has the best color, like oh yeah, color science, skin and tones that. especially. That's my biggest, and that's my biggest thing with like the Sony right. A7 III, which I've shot a ton on. It, the colors absolutely horrible and uh and so it's just the more so you bad. shoot on it oh the more you go oh. well it's like i shot well when we compared it with the red shots yes. oh yeah so out because those were the two huge. cameras we were using yeah. yeah and and that's one thing david and i have both discussed a lot was it, it was a real gripe to us when, especially when david was doing color on vincent's vow was getting the skin tones to be consistent between yeah. the two cameras and it was a it was a disaster he yeah. did a really good job at like making it to where you wouldn't notice but you know the keen eye will notice something like like for for me watching it i mean it was just uh you knew something was different well and yeah. the, so the 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 sony is not very forgiving if you don't expose log the correct right. way yeah. that you're supposed yeah. to and there were shots where where that wasn't done yeah. on our set and we learned yeah. and that's one thing that's the that, first time i'd ever even we rented that camera 
I think we rented. Yeah, we rented it. It wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Tyler didn't even have one yet. Like, right. We had, that was the first time we'd ever shot on it, and uh, so and also too, we've learned I, on aging predators, we which I've, which we've been shooting. There's, we've shot a couple times with both cameras, but not in the same scene. Right. Like we've shot one day we, sh- we needed a gimbal shot. So we just shot on the Sony. Mm-hmm. We didn't in, within the you scene. Didn't we didn't with mix. The red. Yeah. That's why I yeah. told Thomas. I'm like, we're not, we can't mix can't it. Can't mix it. But if, you, if you go from scene to scene, you'll, I don't think you'll ever know. Um, because I think the Sony looks good. The dynamic, dynamic range is great. Like it's 4k. I think it's, I think it, it's great. it looks good compared to itself. It does sometimes, but it doesn't look good compared to something else. Yeah, it's still not as good <laughs> as the red, but I, I don't right. think like, right. you know what I mean? Like as long as it's lit well and it looks you know that the the it the it's cinematic i guess if that right. may, you know like is i think i don't think people will notice because it's very it's just a couple of like little scenes tiny things that we had to do with it but sure because yeah. again that that red which is still my favorite like color mm. like it's beautiful and it's ridiculous but it's just such a big camera i mean it's if you're on a tripod or a dolly you're okay but if you want to do anything where you're following somebody like how many movies like we've been lucky on aging predators. Mm-hmm. It's been so you need, basically need to have a tractor. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> An elephant to like, I don't know something that can <laughs> handle a lot of a camel. But we're going to do a gimbal way. shot here yeah. with yeah. a Massey Ferguson. Yeah. Then we're going to drive it backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, <laughs> or a, or a jib shot with the trunk of an elephant. I like that. There we go. Oh my God. So, but that's, yeah. for, that's for you, Joseph Giddens. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's for Joseph, yes. But see, when you talk to him about, I don't even know if he's got anything that would fly that. Red, I don't know, but but we've definitely well, the black mac. That's what we're, we were talking about doing was renting yes. one of those, renting because the EF mount. We we figured that we would would rent that black magic and, and test with and it. shoot yeah. side to side with the red, yep. and yeah. and test how uh, consistent the colors are with each other. Yeah, yeah. And that's one thing we want to do. Again, it goes back to pre production. If if we are very familiar with all of our tests and everything like that, when we get to production, we know exactly what we're doing. And as long as it's communicated well, we're going to have a lot better looking film. I mean, Vincent's Fowl was a great looking film. Don't get me wrong, but if we're not learning, but it as took much a lot. Of, can, it took a lot of on set work. It did to get there. It did. I mean, yeah. our, our first day of shooting too, because we hadn't played with the red camera enough. Our final scene, uh, the camera started having a fit with the solid state drive that was in it, yeah. and and we didn't know what to do about it, and played around with it, and was afraid we were going to lose all the footage from the day. And so we abandoned shooting that last scene of that first day because we weren't we mm-hmm. weren't sure about it. And then you know because yeah, David yeah. and I were both disturbed by it, I think David went and researched some stuff, and we yeah. found out what it was doing, and and was able to go from there after yeah. that. So uh, you don't want those kinds of things to happen on set. Mm-hmm. I mean, we adjusted, you know, we made the most of it, but uh, it could have been better if we didn't. And w- and we live in a world where like well, even with the black magic like you know I, they, they you can't push the ISO on those as, I don't think as far as you can like the Sony's sort of got the the market cornered on how mm, like, on their the ISO, ISO setting, performance, yeah. but you can still go on the on the red we never went above eight hundred ISO ever, and I mean it, to me that, that blows my mind because with the so with the Sony I'll go to five thousand eight thousand and not even really question it. Was yeah, like, looking at stuff people are going like sixteen hundred and that's yeah. what they were filming everything with and I'm like okay. Okay, that's, that's weird. weird. Yeah, because in the Black Magic, I think thirty two hundred is kind of the sweet spot. Like you don't really go, but you can go past it. Because with Black well, Magic, I mean, you native get on it is eight hundred, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. and eight eight hundred is what's native on the red. But um, but with the Black Magic, you know, another thing too is you get with DaVinci Resolve, you get um, there's noise reduction that's built in that's built to work with the Black Magic raw footage, um, which one of the guys that reviewed the camera was talking about that and showing it within Resolve, but. So there's definitely some advantages because we were trying to figure out well, how can we get a f- this filmic look, but not have to spend like a crap ton of money. And sure, I just yeah. keep th- going back. I keep circling back around to, to that black magic. Yeah. And um, so we're going to try to rent some lenses and stuff like that and test it. But, but um, and see I, how it performs in dark and sure. all that kind of stuff. I and filmed. So. Uh, was it two weeks ago? Uh, a friend of mine was like, "Hey, I need to do a really quick commercial and." I had, I mean, I had a Blackmagic uh, Pocket 4K. Which and is super I nice. Donated it to the church so they could stream their church services. Oh, nice. It's a great camera. It right? is. They kind of don't know what they have. Oh, To yeah. be honest. Yeah. yeah. But okay. I, it was the one that I was like, I don't, I use this the least because I was using my Z cam and I was like, this is the one I use the least. And it was just the easiest because you could plug it in. You have AC power, you know, directly built sure. into the side of it. And so I went over and I was like, hey, I'll just use this camera. And I pulled it up and I shot everything in B-Raw. You know, 
small file size yep. in B-Raw. And I mean, we did like two takes and it looked like butter when it came out. Yeah. Nice. It's and great. it was very like, nice. Oh, wow. That looks really, really good. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Shut yeah. up. I, I literally just hit the record button. That's, that's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's one thing. That that's talk, good. That's I was talking to somebody the other day. I was like, you know, like it really does. Like, I sh- again, I, I shot a ton of weddings on just my Canon 6D, which 1080p, 8-bit color, like you don't go above like 400 ISO. Like you, it's really, you can do stuff with it, but like I, I managed to get it, to make it look good enough that people wanted me, other people wanted me to shoot their weddings. But it's like now shooting on the red, the Sony, like you're like, man, like this makes me look so good. <laughs> like these right, cameras are right. so good. Oh, like yeah. the, the images, especially yes. the red, you know, there's images coming out of it. Like, like I can't, I don't feel like I can take credit for it. I mean, like he I can lit it, but like he it can, just, he can take credit for it. He's just being just extremely looks, humble because, the uh, so good. because I've, I've shot with that exact same camera, David, and uh, my stuff just doesn't look comparable. So you're just more so, critical of your own work. Right? That's what it is. Perhaps, so. perhaps, but, uh, but I know, you know, what looks more beautiful when you compare them side by side. And well, uh, your your knowledge of lighting has um, grown exponentially. It has. Uh, yeah. The podcast isn't meant to butter people it's, up, but uh, I'm going to stroke you a little but bit. But part of it is, is if any time... It looks so good. If at any time you're on set with Brad, yeah. you're going to yeah. learn more than you ever wanted to yeah. know then about lighting. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> like Brad, yeah. I don't just... Turn and that's good to point this way. Oh, no, it is. It He's is. so great. He's which so is great. which is what we need to do um, when we do our our test our yeah. test runs for pre production. Yeah. Is have Brad there and let him have his day talking about oh, it, yeah. right? you know, right. so we can learn as much as we can. Um, and and he's doing some pretty cool things too. He bought some HMIs, which I'd really like to get my oh, hands on. He did. Like he literally uh, can't I power mean, them. Yeah, you can't power them. It was like sixteen Ks. Like uh, like if we end up using them on Duel Seriously. of Justice, then I'm going to have to call a power company and have them oh, wire in a temporary a four hundred amp box to run those things, Sweet. which is what he's doing so, right now. Yeah. So yeah, that's what Brad's doing. And uh, depending on our location, that's so awesome. You know, I know dude, then I'm so excited. that's one one of the notes I'm trying to do as a producer is actually prepare enough electricity to run those lights because we're, we've got some night shots uh, and, and that red isn't real good you can't, in the dark. You've got to light it extremely, right. extremely well. and then Those will be too it. much. I'll just tell you that right oh, yeah, now. They, they will. I mean, we'll, we'll tone it down some, sure. The but fun. what it allows us to do is, is turn the ISO down yeah. and, and uh, really you can crush it quite a bit from there. But you're going to get, you're not going to, deal with what is that what we call that the little snowflake look uh in your night shots that you get from, like noise yeah noise, yeah, noise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. the <laughs> digital noise. look the, i've those, forgotten how to those film those hmis are like those are if you need need to if you're outside but you need and if it's cold you've outside got negative fill and you yeah. need something brighter on this sure. side you pop out one but of if those if you want to get a shot of the moon in a back the background of some outlaw towering over somebody laying on the ground and you don't have a moon right mm-hmm. you can use that you can use moon. an hmi and create a pretty hey. cool silhouette you know, there's, you can there's use a the lot HMI of use. I mean, you can use other if you things. want to. Yeah, you you kind of can. Yeah. Anyway, I, I just want to play with it a little bit. Yeah. Well, we were doing, we did Land of Milk and Honey. And I, I know I've talked about it before, but it was the first time I'd actually like really experienced standing in the doorway. And it was like the sun was down and they had this light, one of these Aries out there. And I mean, massive the thing was, mad. and I'm standing there and I'm like, the side of my face is burning up. And I mean, that light was 20 feet away. And I'm like, man, I can feel that light all the way over through. I mean, it was yeah. outside oh, and man. there was a breeze. Oh, no blowing. And I mean, it was like uh, the power of those lights and how warm it's they insane. are is crazy. Yeah. That is insane. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cause Brad's got his little five K. We did that. He was shining oh, yeah. it through a window and I could feel the heat through the window from that light. Yeah. It was insane. Crazy. That's, that's pretty cool. But anyways, all right, I want to get so back I on digress. track here. Because this this is what happens. We digress we all the time. Hey, it's all connected. <laughs> it's all connected. We're sorry well, the, that the, the, the average the, person didn't understand like the last ten minutes. Uh, well, the the point sorry. the point uh, the point that I'd like to drive home is for any potential investors out there looking at film in the film industry. David Watson knows what he's doing, and he's our DP. So, so um, that's why we can segue into some of this technical stuff. Because for me, when I started filmmaking, I knew how to tell a story. I didn't know technical stuff. And now we've got a great supporting group of people that know the technical stuff. Yeah. And we've gotten a lot of, uh, a lot of I don't want to use the word praise, but a lot of uh, 
great comments from people out there that have seen the film as to how good it looks. The distributor that we're going with asked what our budget was on Vincent's Vow. And I said, well, with the sweat equity, my, mine and Mike's sweat equity, um, it's right around one, 140K. We spent 82, I think, K in, in dollar amount. I would say you undervalued yourself on that. I did. I did, but that's basically what I put on paper. Right. And, and he says, wow, just watching the film, I would have guessed it was more than twice that. Yeah. And, and so he says it's just pretty clear that you guys were very resourceful in how you approached the filming of that. Um, and, and so, yeah, basically, I mean, there's some learning things that we got to do, but uh, we know what we're doing. Yeah. We know how to tell a story and see a movie through. And apparently um, this distributor also wants a, a long-term partnership and basically has said that, you know, if you're producing more content like this, we want to be your partner on future films and just work with you on those. So uh, ultimately, any yeah. investor out there looking at it, we can almost guarantee that this will get distribution. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's a fantastic development so cool. for sure. And I'm very grateful. Man. It's exciting. It is exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but, but when it comes to the story element, uh, I think... That's where we segued off, wasn't it, Tom? It was. Oh, boy. Okay. So the story the story element of it, again, I can't uh, – it, it's surprising. There's a lot of yeah, mystery to it. We don't want to so tell too much So I won't dive it. into it too much. But the idea is um, – I'll just briefly talk about it. It's It follows a court case in the Old West, and it uh, it looks one way. Then as the court case develops, it looks another way and then looks another way. And so you go for quite a ride. It will keep the audience guessing as to what's going on. So that's basically the backdrop. That's the backdrop, right? yes. And, and the reason why I chose that backdrop, because I'm a completely insane person and thought, oh, yeah, independent film. We can afford to do a period piece. It's like there's Western buildings all around. There's not. Um, <clears throat> my, my point is, is that uh, that is a good backdrop to have a discussion about justice because the Old West, that was the discussion. Oh, yeah. The, well, it's when a lot of that, that stuff the was... The frontier, yeah. I mean, so much of it, so much of justice was, there was the this group of people that thought vengeance was justice. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth type, you know, law of Moses type thing, which Tevye from Fiddler on the Roof says leaves the whole world blind and toothless if we do it that way. We are currently blind and toothless and we, right we now. We are currently <laughs> blind and toothless, absolutely, because because we've been approaching it that way. But this is a... This is a invitation i guess in an entertaining way because it's a narrative story it's not a documentary um it's going to be just strictly observed you can come to your own conclusions watching the film um but it's going to have plenty of action in it and uh, plenty of drama but it's going to definitely include is there gonna be any kissing in it um and hugging kissing and hugging was there in vincent's vow there was a little bit. There was a little bit. There was like a moment. Um, there, there might be a little kissing. And a little bit of hugging. kissing. A little right. bit of hugging. No, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> that's, the, that's the kind of stuff David cut his teeth on was kissing yeah. and hugging. I did, I did, did cut my cut? teeth on kissing and hugging. <laughs> Weddings. You cut your teeth. a lot of kisses. A lot of first kisses. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. I'm not, I'd, they'd be hugging. I'd be like, okay, now kid, give her a kiss. Lean and give her a kiss. You know, like. <laughs> Is that what you're going to say we're while doing we're doing principal <laughs> photography on a <laughs> bill of justice? Yep. Two, two guys are ready to draw their revolver on each other lean and say, now lean in, give them a kiss. Yeah. Yep. Give them a kiss. Okay. <laughs> Hold each other like All this. Right. We're going to work. Yeah. Um, as, uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up about this, too, is that uh, I'm looking at about probably 70, 75 percent of the shooting of this film to take place right here in Missouri. Oh, that's awesome. And about 30 <clears> percent <throat> um, in southern Utah, northern Arizona, among the Red Mountains and the <sighs> old west look and stuff like that. I was that. just there last year. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It'll give a lot of texture to it. Um, but at the same time, I do reserve the right to change my mind about it being a period piece. Oh, really? I do. Because the story can still be there and can be placed in a modern context if the budget isn't there. Right. Has David heard about that? My, mm, I know. I'm sorry, David. I just, I, I only saw thank on you, Tom. Western. Thank it. you, David. Oh, dude. Okay. Well, that's David, shot. that shot's gone. Oh boy. <laughs> and cut. No, we're, I mean, 
obviously, obviously the Western is what I'm going for. However, you could go for motorcycles. All I'm saying is, is that I'm not going to ex- uh, use lack of budget as an excuse to not, not to tell it, this yeah. story. Yeah. Um, in other words, I'm going to see it through. Yeah. If, if we start on it, I'm going to see it through. Well, do kind if anybody out there will see it through, I have complete and utter confidence that you can do it. Well, thank you. Is that pending, David, strangling me for you know throwing this? Dude, I told you what I would just want to shoot whatever Duke on thinking. Oh, so. oh boy, yeah, David's yeah. too good to me. Yeah, for real. What a champion. <laughs> well, you know, it's um, it is, it is a very. This is a, and I'll just kind of wax poetic for a second. I mean, I look at like, I've worked on multiple projects. Um, uh, Vincent's Val, the crew that was at Vincent's Val, that was something, uh, I don't, I don't care if you are a religious person or not. That was a divine experience. There was a lot of really good Amen. relationships that came from that. And there were a lot of positives that from in my life, just my life alone, uh, that I can go back and attribute and go and hey, these are the people that I met and these were positive experience. I mean, I never would have met either one of you two guys. We wouldn't be sitting here now, really, right. if I hadn't been there on set and if you hadn't done the film. Right. And right. so there's, I mean, and there's even more relationships that came from that. Like I'm, I'm doing a show with Aline O'Neill down in, in, um, in Branson and um, uh, Jennifer Battell. So those are relationships that I've, got from Vincent's vow. I mean, everything uh, happened from that. And so you, you look at it and go, give me more. I want more. Right. I want yeah. more. I want more of those experiences. I want you know, more of that. I'm glad you brought that up because, because uh, I'm trying to get as much of that team back as possible. And uh, you know, I, on this Western duel of justice, I've got right around 30 speaking roles. I uh, don't freak out. I had 46 in Vincent's vow. So I cut back. I know you guys are scared, but just, you know, stick with me here. <laughs> yeah, but well, at least um, Kong will have some work, right? Will. Kong doesn't be, <laughs> you know, I, let's talk about Kong for a minute. Everybody <laughs> likes to be talked about in public, right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But, uh, but you know, he, he's got a Western look. He does. He does. I mean, I definitely want to have him on set and that's a discussion we'll have uh, but Debbie Sutcliffe, who was in Vincent's Val, yeah. um, is going to take on a role. I talked to George Cron this morning. He's very interested in a role. Um, uh, I will be playing a part in it. Hopefully, the great Tom Baker will oh, be yeah. playing a part in it. Definitely. <laughs> okay. Awesome. As long, awesome. as long as I get to kill someone. <laughs> oh, yeah, well. <laughs> I just love the idea of it's killing a, somebody. You know, <laughs> I no, know. no, I don't. I don't need to kill it, anyone. It, it, you come close. Let me. Jonah does die, and I did shoot. That's the only person I think I've, I've ever move I've ever done where somebody actually dies. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so Jonah dies. I will well, give away spoilers. Well, I'm not going to give spoilers on on Duel of Justice, but uh, but but somebody dies in it, and the villain does kill him. The the true villain. And uh, and uh, and we'll leave it at that. M- murders another <laughs> that doesn't die, but he thought did. So, so cool. um, and and you know when I was like, man, who is this uh, villainous character? Who could play this guy? There's only one person that came to mind, and that was Tom Baker. That's You're awesome. gonna look so good in, <laughs> in, in chaps and a hat. I can't wait. Oh my goodness! My wife says I look great in chaps and a See? hat. There you, yeah. go. you know, we we need to do a uh, a cameo scene with Hawk Holman. Oh. Where you just punch and punch and punch the guy. He needs to get he needs to get beat up on camera. He does because he beats everybody else up on camera. <laughs> it's just not fair. <laughs> or at least have more you guys do like them. <laughs> right? Yes. yes. Oh my god. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Predator callback. Uh. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that. Absolutely. I love that poster. Yeah. Those are well, and you know, guys, that's the cool thing about this, and then having a background in community theater uh you don't get paid for community theater so you have to learn early on in the process that you got to do it for the love of it i mean it's 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 rough there's a lot of time it's like right now i'm doing you know three or four different projects and then i leave at night drive down to branson to go rehearse and you come back and i've had people go 
how do you, you know, how do you do, you know, how do you make that? You don't make any time. You don't make time for it. Mm -hmm. Time is what it is. You don't get to make any, right? You don't get it back either. So you just got to really love it and you got to make it a priority. Sure. And, yep. Um, there's a lot of people in this area. And if you're listening to this and you're not into this, uh, you're not into um, making films, but you're into watching films, there's a large group of people out here. And I'll just say this. There is a large group um, of people in this town that are very stinking talented in what they do. And through whatever reason, through every walk of life, they choose not to live in an area that is a high industry area for filmmaking. We don't live in Los Angeles. We don't live in Atlanta. We're not union. Uh, We are just people out there that like doing this. And we have every right to go out and make films. We have every right to express ourselves that way. And we do it for not only our own entertainment, but we do it for yours. But the difference is, is filming is not cheap. Absolutely. <laughs> it, it would be great if there was a group out there that gave away $20,000 cameras that you could film this. So we didn't get critiqued and go, uh, that camera color is horrible. No, we're trying to, we, right. we, we try to combat those type of things Absolutely. when we make films here. Uh, absolutely. My, my point in saying that is, is if you feel or if you want something to give to, uh, monetarily wise or sweat equity wise, um, get in touch with us. Um, we'll have do con, uh, we'll have do more films. You can reach out to do con at do more films. You can reach out to David Watson at Valley high pictures. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. And then you could reach out to me at the Bravo creative podcast. Um, and we'll be more than happy to, uh, use your money for good things because, uh, Dukon is very Dukon is someone that honors the money that he gets because he does it um to uplift the viewer and to give them hope and to give them an idea and to take all that thought that he's put into things and he puts it out there on the screen and it's a positive message. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are points where it seems like it's not a positive message. Like if you watch Vincent's Vow, there's a couple parts where you go, wow, this gets pretty depressing. But then he fixes it. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah, the law of contrast. Right, yes. right. That's what I really loved about Vincent's Vow. Vincent's Vow was a very complex film. Mm. It was a very complex film for a, a faith-based film. It was a complex film for kind of like, I mean, it had a little bit of a rom-com feel to it. It had some action elements in it. Mm-hmm. It was kind of a, I don't know what you would call that film. I mean, the more and more I think about it and the more I step off of it is mm-hmm. what type of film was it? it? It was a drama, but I was going for not so much an, an emotional it's a Dukana. roller coaster. It's a Dukana. A Dukana. <laughs> It's, it's a Dukana film. That's a term. It's a new name now. Wow, it's a Dukana. Dukana. I guess it is. That's a term. Dukana. Oh, boy. Right. We'll have to define that one. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, ultimately, and and I appreciate. Well, first of all, uh, I don't know how you come up with all these grandiloquent and oratorical <laughs> words that you do. What did I say? But but that monologue you did a minute ago was epic. I couldn't have I said it better myself. So, uh, kudos to you. Oh, thank you. That's really awesome. Um, yes. One of the things that, that is very, very, very important to me as a filmmaker and really let's just set this, the filmmaker title aside, but as a citizen, one of the things that is very important to me is to not get caught up in, Oh, the doom and gloom, the world's a mess and society's going downhill and we're we're just all screwed. No, it's up to us to do something about it. This is our world. We need to make something of it. And, and if we have a talent in the filmmaking, I guess, uh, I'll just call it a box because I can't think of grandiloquent and oratorical words like Tom, but in, in just the filmmaking box, if we have the talent we should be using that medium to make a better world. And that's my desire. That's my hope. Yeah. Because 
when my my kids are growing up pretty fast i mean i'm looking over at crosby here david's son he's seven years old now and david's probably thinking the same thing what world are we creating for our children yeah and uh that's up to us we're up to bat we're we making need to hit a home run. Yeah. We're making depressing cynic, cynics is what we're making right now. <laughs> but well, and, and, and to that point, I mean, I think well, it's like for me, you know, I've been doing theater twenty five years and I used to not put it into that um I didn't when I first started doing theater, I didn't put it into that place in my head where I felt I needed to um ask for Thank, be, being thankful for it, mm-hmm. being thankful for my talent or the things that I did. Mm-hmm. And only until I got, oh, I started getting really in-depth in it. I started actually, before I would go out on stage, I would say just a little prayer to myself. Excellent. And I would just be like, you know, thank you for, thank you for, number one, giving me a, something to love, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, like... Wow. Yeah. You know, thank yeah. you for just the ability to find excitement in things because yeah. being around, there's a lot of people that you see walking up and down the streets and they don't know what to love. Right. They don't know yeah. where they fit in. And I am so thankful that I had a compass that was pointed in a certain direction yeah. at a young yep. age and go, this is something that I absolutely just love and I'm willing to go the distance on. Right. Yeah. And it's such a hard thing, I think, for people we we have a tendency to not appreciate it mm-hmm. and then we also have a tendency to surround ourselves with people sometimes that don't appreciate it either they like to take advantage of it or they like mm-hmm. to go oh hey i can i can go make some money off this person because they love doing that stuff i got to a point where i had to realize i love it and i've got to protect it because it is something special to me Sure. It is something yeah. that I look at and go, no, this is a gift that I was given mm-hmm. and I have to treat it like a gift and I have to treat it with respect. And so I got very, I got to a point where I got very, almost just got very uh, faith based in my idea of this yeah. was a talent that God gave me and I need to utilize it. Yes. And he's giving me this gift to provide for me too mm-hmm. as well. And so that's something that you have to keep, you know, in mind. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and again, I mean, you're a wordsmith. <laughs> the way you word things, that's incredible. And I would just have to say a big hearty amen to that, especially when it comes to, uh, yes, we are currently dealing with, um, I guess, a landscape of depression in our world. Mm-hmm. And entertainment can sometimes give us relief, inspiration. It can give us uh, education that we're not aware of. And uh, we, we've got talents, and that's not meant to be a, a cocky, arrogant statement. Mm-hmm. I don't mean that in, in that way. But we've, we've got talents, and I agree, we, we must utilize them for the greater good. Yeah. If we're doing it just for ourselves, to, to build ourselves up, to um, self-promote, I guess, if that's like our motive, I don't think that we're using it for the right reasons. Yeah. That's, just, that's just my opinion. Um, but I think that if, if you're thinking about the people out there, then you have a lot better chance of telling a story that will resonate with them. Yeah. And if only J.J. Abrams would have figured that out when he did Return, Rise of Skywalker, we would have had a lot better Star Wars film. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. I'm you do realize it. David I, is here on the podcast, I right? I am in the minority. I loved Rise of Skywalker. What? I, I, I Are loved, you serious? I loved Wonder Woman I loved 84. Rises, so I, lo- I, I loved Rise you know, of Skywalker. He just liked I did too. I loved Rise of Skywalker. I'm going to get on it. Don't get me started. And that's what I was saying. Because he just liked the lens flares. I did. <laughs> nice flare. not like the yeah. Not like the Star Trek movie. Hey, maybe. honey, look at, the, look at the lens flare in the corner. Oh, I love that, I love that movie. <laughs> I liked, Abrams is my favorite. I liked it because <laughs> Force Awakens set it up. Whatever number eight was called because it's garbage. Just like flushed it down the toilet and then then you're like okay well what do we do now with this story because i set up all these things and then yeah rise of skywalker was the, i like the it. redemption part it. of the the arc of that they, final he basically trilogy. put two movies into one because they, the second movie was terrible yeah, they totally messed up the, the last movie. jedi was was where it fell yeah. apart i feel like um, he was just trying to fix it at that point but they totally messed up the ending did you see the, the guy did, that re edit? Yeah. Did you guy that did you see the guy mm-hmm. that re edit? Oh, mm-hmm. you need, I'll send you the video. Yeah, send it to me. I'm gonna see it. They oh. get they get every force ghost 
to appear at the end. No, I thought that's what they would do. Well, it, right. Everybody on the planet thought that, oh, except for stinking J.J. Abrams didn't think that. It, there, trust me, <laughs> he it was, was trying not to a, it's not a perfect movie. I don't mean it like it's perfect. Sure. I enjoyed it. Sure. But it's definitely... I think they should just forget about them and go back and do three more. Every time I, oh, I've watched it twice. And the second time I watched it, like within the first like 30 seconds, I could hear like the back of a garbage truck backing up right at the very beginning. Cause I knew it was going to just take, drop a big load. <laughs> like, oh, there it is. <laughs> oh no. No, I, I get the feeling no. that Tom's uh, Tom's yeah. really critical. Yeah, I, hey, you know, I was never more pissed than when I walked out of, um, uh, the what was the second one? Or Last the, Jedi? Was it the Last Jedi? Yeah, I was yeah, never me. more mad at anything me too. in my life. I, I was so I, I was so mad in the movie so theater. Cool. So was yep. Mark Hamill about that. Wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh! So, yeah. I mean, they took his life's work and had him drink uh, blue milk. Blue milk yeah. out of some because it, it, it was, was a funny joke. It was yeah. abs. And then I, it, there was a little moments where he, you know, he, she, she, Ray, finally, you get, you know, at the end of, of seven, she gets there and she hands him the lightsaber. And then the beginning of eight, she hands him the lightsaber and he just tosses it over his shoulder. And then in nine, he's like, he, she throws it into the fire and he catches it. And he's mm-hmm. like, some basically he's like, we have to show more respect to, sure. to a Jedi's weapon than this. And it's like a total face punch to Ryan right. Johnson and what the garbage that he put out. Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. sorry absolute garbage I i'm not saying the for the seventh and eight seven and nine are like perfect they're not and I, I again i wish they had gone a totally different route with all of it but eight was absolute the holder manu- holo maneuver where they oh. just lights like we, we really you literally do that in the first movie and we don't we don't have eight other movies it's so stupid yeah so stupid so stupid. sorry i brought it put up. a droid in a oh in that, a, that's what i'm yeah. that's what i'm saying <laughs> just, it's you're opening a can of worms but i mean don't get me that, started dude. I, I do have a confession to make anyways i actually haven't seen any of the new star wars trilogy and that's i know okay. i've been throwing opinions out about it and i don't get an opinion that's so okay. But one thing I did learn from the discussion, and that is that Tom Baker is very, very critical. And so when I get to the rough cut of Duel of Justice, send it to Tom. I want you to look at it yeah. and, and cut it to pieces. There you go. All right. I'll yeah. do it. All right. Awesome. Well, awesome. and you know, and that's the, the funny part. Uh, the one well, that's not, it's not funny. The hard part about it is, is um, because I've been working on uh, a film that I was in. Is I thought I was going to have a harder time with my performance, <laughs> and so when you get in and you actually like start watching, because I'm sure you had to deal with this too in Vincent's Val. Yeah. So I wanted to talk to you about talk with this about you. <laughs> yeah, the wording. Was, that, I get what you that mean. didn't come out right. Reverse. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> Reverse. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you edited Vincent's Val. Yeah. So. Were there times when you were editing Vincent's Val where you saw your performance and you edited the scene around your performance opposed to somebody else's? I probably did, but I don't think I noticed that I did. Right. If that makes sense. Well, yeah, I mean, I can... The the question came up in my head because I'm sitting here and I look at it and I go, um, that has got to be very hard because it's like I'm working on uh, the show down in Branson and the whenever I go up and sing on stage, the voice that I hear is not the same voice that everybody out in the audience hears. Mm-hmm. So I go up there and sing, and I sound like an old man in my head, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. But then, like, Aline will be out there, and she goes, oh, your voice sounds beautiful. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not hearing it. Yeah. So I've had I'm that. more critical of yeah. the way my voice sounds than somebody else's. So then I would also think that if you were an editor and you were editing yourself, mm-hmm. are you going to be overly critical of your performance more so than you're going to be on, oh, that was fine. Val did fine on that one. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, over over critical on a lot of that. In fact, uh, in fact, I re, I do remember that there were a couple lines that I was so critical of that were important to the plot that I cut because of my performance. Really? Yeah, because I didn't like any of the takes with how I said it, 
and uh, just didn't feel like it was consistent with the character. And just that may have been a result of me trying to be a director and an actor at the same time. Well, because you run into the same thing when you know? you're the cinematographer uh-huh. and the editor. Oh, sure. Right? Because oh, you look sure. at go, yeah. oh, dude, like, I'm like, I've, the pictures of the one I did, you know, uh-huh. it's my little short film that maybe one day we'll see the light of day, but like, I'm, I'm bad about like, like in about a month and a half, hopefully <laughs> Good <goal>. September, the, <laughs> uh, it, it is to like, I definitely like notice, yeah, you know, as, as a deep shots. Yeah. So you would probably be very critical when yeah. it comes to editing and saying, you know what? I didn't hit that focus pull just right. the way I wanted to, or, or the, like dolly was, the, shot. the dolly was rough. There's or a little something like that bounce in the gimbal yeah. shot yeah, or yeah. Like that kind of stuff for sure. So yeah, absolutely. And sometimes limited by your, your, uh, editing software. If their warp yeah. stabilizer can't get it right. Yeah. Uh, and you were kind of depending on it, doing that shot, mm-hmm. right. <laughs> then you cut the shot. And yeah, in fact, yeah. I, I had to do that on Vincent's foul. It wasn't because of your work by any means, David. It was actually because I thought it would work differently than it did. Oh, gotcha. And so I would, I would eliminate certain shots that I was adamant yeah. about using just because it didn't turn out how I had imagined it. Here's a pro tip. <laughs> if you're going to film with a gimbal or a steady cam or any kind of moving shot, Shoot it with a wider lens. Yep. Shoot it in 4K. Mm. Shoot it at the highest resolution you can shoot it, mm. and then run it through warp stabilizer. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good that's, tip. That's one of the that's advantages a really good to tip. a like Magic Pocket 6K. That is. It, yeah, yeah. Is we the the 6K crop it more. Shooting them with 6K, yeah. you can crop it in. If you're gonna do like even right. 6K on a 16 mil lens, and, and uh, there you go. Boom. That'd be that, awesome. Uh, because I'm using the Z-Cam S6, mm-hmm. which is a Super 35 6K camera. Mm. And you can, I mean, it's so stinking sharp. And I've been able to balance it to every single camera. I mean, there nice. hasn't been a camera I haven't been able to balance it to. Nice. That's crazy. That's how, that's how awesome their log is on it. I mean, wow. that's, the, that's the gist. That's where Sony screwed up. Sony made log for them. They didn't make it for people shooting sony with a red camera Mm -hmm. right they made logs so that you could grade their film they didn't make log is supposed to be so that you could use multiple cameras from multiple different manufacturers Mm -hmm. sony never wanted to play ball Mm -hmm. they definitely i mean i I don't i don't know i mean the color science is the biggest thing for me just because it's like it's a nightmare but i know the newer ones are supposed to be better Mm -hmm. a7s3 i think is supposed to be really close to like good, but it's still from what I can read and find and see, it just doesn't match up to the black yeah, magic. Yeah, yeah. Even the black like, black Apparently, like they the Gen Gen Five or something like that color that they use, like they've even gone back now and you can you can update your oh yeah your black magic four Ks or whatever yeah and get the new mm-hmm. color science in yeah. there. They had like mm-hmm. a they but they do they're really good about firmware updates and. You know, there was a color with the back of the monitor on the 6K Pro that was blue. It was like tinted. It was till it went to the blue mm-hmm. side, and now they've got software you can do that. And there's steps you can take to actually, you can calibrate your monitor, and then you're just one time and you're good to go. Well, the the line, image wasn't bluer, yeah. but, but the monitor was bluer. Mm-hmm. But. And Black Magic has so many like, um, like one of the coolest things I really liked about the Black Magic was that like, let's say you're just gonna you're you've got one day that you're gonna go and film takes, right? Let's yeah. say you got two of them. You can set this black, this black magic up over here, set that one up over there. Mm-hmm. And every shot, it will keep track of all your takes. And so then it has that metadata already built in. Oh, really? Oh, that is cool. it names your file that way. Wow. So then when you're pulling it out from a DIT standpoint, which wow. is the most important part yeah. of uh, filming. Yes, right? yeah, absolutely. When you pull that stuff off and you put it down on there, then all of a sudden now you've got your take. You've got, you can even mark whether it was a good take or a bad take on it. Yeah. And it's all right there on that little screen. You just push it and you go, okay, that was great. So That's your cool. camera assistant or your focus pull or whatever can be mm-hmm. sitting there going, okay, how was that yeah. take? Do we like that one? Boom. Mm-hmm. And it makes all those notes. Then if you bring it into DaVinci Resolve, Final Cut, or Premiere, it pulls all that down. That's right. amazing. That's crazy. That's so you can set really keywords cool. on all that from a Final Cut standpoint or... Oh, um, nice. Uh, yeah. Premiere probably does something you have to have a plug-in to work with the raw apparently on the, oh on yeah there. it's like 30 bucks for the plug-in to use the black magic raw the the pro res still works and good luck finding the the shot if you're using premiere oh my gosh yeah. <laughs> oh, i've done it <laughs> i've done it it wasn't easy but i've done it i literally took a project that was in premiere mm-hmm. i took it i exported it out i had to import it into black magic 
export it out of black magic to a final cut file mm. Mm. and bring it all back in. Wow. <laughs> And yes, yeah. and that I, was a two-day process. The oh way gosh. that Da Vinci does it is, I mean, you shoot and you shoot Black Magic raw, and it's shot in a DNG file, mm-hmm. which is just a whole bunch of stills. Yeah, but if it, no, if it's, it's a B raw file. It's a B raw. Yeah, okay, but yeah, it's, it's still B-raw. it's still compiled of a whole bunch of stills, mm-hmm. except for uh, if you bring it directly into Da Vinci, it already just brings it in as your yeah. video clip. Yeah, yeah, which is nice. But, mm-hmm. but most other programs won't recognize it that way. They have a the let's see I think Premiere has a plugin now yeah they do and I th- think Final Cut has a plugin that it you basically run it through that and it it'll do it that it'll way it. right it compiles it mm-hmm. into the video clip sequence I've, I've get, I've it gotten, makes it to a ProRes for Final Cut do you edit Pro and what do you edit in most of the time Final, Final Cut. Cut okay because yeah. I've started oh, nice. I've started messing around with with DaVinci Resolve but. Just because the color is still supposed to be so much better. But anyways, um, I've edited, not edited stuff, but just messed in there, like mm-hmm. putting clips together and stuff. And it seems pretty easy. You just got to learn all the You got to figure out the nodes on it. The nodes, the nodes I've started using it. Really, the nodes to me are like layers of Lumetri color in Premiere. Mm-hmm. You just add a node, you make a change, you, right. wanna, you change your whatever, and then you... You know, that way you, not everything is baked into one layer. It's just right. like, it's like in Photoshop, you know, you make changes and that way if you, you're like, oh, that one thing I did 10 steps so ago, it's down. just this one layer and you can go back and find yeah. Like with Lumetri, uh-huh. I'll have, yeah. I'll have in Lumetri, I'll have 10 layers of Lumetri. I'll do, I'll do like white balance and then I'll create another, a new mm-hmm. one and then I'll do, and it's like, that way I can go back and adjust right. or I can completely delete one if I feel like right. this is you stupid. Can, you can isolate a sky from skin tones and stuff like that, All by, that stuff. by having different can, layers. It just helps. So, yeah. So yeah, I'll have a absolutely. ton of them. Yeah. But anyways, I've gotten into, I started messing with Resolve because they were great. You can, have the, you can get their free one and uh, their, the free version of it, which is like basically 80%, I think, of like their full it's package. It's pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. I've got yeah. the full, I've got the the full blown version of it. Yeah. yeah. And that, that comes with so when you buy, you buy the camera, the camera, the camera you'll get comes the with full the full blown version. version. Oh, it's pretty okay. cool. Yeah. 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 And I think you can use it up to like two machines. Okay. On that. That's so nice. Very yeah. cool. But it's uh it's not subscription based then. Mm-mm. Wow. I think uh let's go shopping, David. I know, right? Thomas <laughs> was starting to was gonna I think was gonna edit Aging Predators and Resolve, but then apparently there's some issues with because I was dumping footage to his hard drive and he edits on a Mac and I'm on a PC. Oh, yeah. And so the XFAT or whatever it's called, like apparently Resolve has issues with like drives that are formatted to XFAT, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, oh, wow. so he was basically, he texted me the other day. He's like, I think I'm going to just stick to Premiere and just edit in there, which he's used to and that's fine sure. with me. And he knows how to use it. Yeah, yeah. 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 So um, he gets really buggy if you get too many elements in it. But yeah, if, if I've. <laughs> Premiere. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Those guys, it gave me a lot of problems. I get those. I, I don't even want to mess it with it. It crashes now and it brings up the like, yep. here, send a report. I'm just like, the most terrible things I can think to the say. The biggest like, you issue. People the third act, it's just stupid. Like, literally, all I did was alt mouse click to shrink the timeline and it crashed. Yep. What do you want from me? Like, yep. fix, yeah. your, fix your software. I'm paying $30 a month for this and well, it had been since 2014. Right. Fix the biggest it. issue I had right. on Final Cut is trying to get the. Um, AAF file. It doesn't generate one. Oh. So if I want to do any kind of audio mastering afterwards or send it out to an audio master, it oh. doesn't have that. So I had to buy a. Oh wow. I had to buy like a third party, which I mean the third party app supposedly work. I got to work on that today to see if. Okay. Yeah. Because there's some sound files that didn't come through. So I'm like, well, is that because of Final Cut or is that because of this or because yeah. of my own downside? But that's yeah. the only big, huge issue I've had in Final Cut. Okay. I love the way Final Cut, how you can organize. You can organize so much better okay. in oh, really? Final Cut than you can in Premiere. Premiere. Okay. Yeah. I'm used to Premiere now. Like, I'm, I'm kind of... I'm used to it. So I've kind of got an, a way, of, like a workflow for organizing mm-hmm. all the footage and, and audio stuff and, and, and whatnot. But, um, and even like Resolve, I was messing with their little bins or whatever they're mm-hmm. called. And it, it's really similar to me to Premiere. I don't, I didn't really see a big difference in it. It's, it's, uh, it's just learning it differently. It's and, however you, you know, get like, I and mean, there's no right or wrong. I edit wrong. my podcasts in Final Cut. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Because I know all the, right. Yes. All the buttons. Totally. So it's yeah. just easy to, to edit it. That there's way. no right or wrong software to use. It's just kind of what you like. And right. some have advantages, but honestly on the level where like independent film, it's not like we're, I mean, 
any of them really work fine. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. As long as it gets done. Exactly. So that people can see it. Yep. Yep. Right? That's exactly right. So, Well, guys, um, we... We have covered quite a bit today. Yeah. Um, Dukon, is there anything else you want to say before we sign off? Yeah, actually there is, and I'll just summarize it as quick as I can here. So um, summarizing it, uh, yes, we're looking to make a feature-length Western film. I'm hoping that this fall we shoot a proof of concept. I'm looking for investors. Uh, we have a distribution partner that's picking up Vincent's Vow and wants to pick up future films. And I've got uh, about 20 speaking roles that are still up for audition. We'll be holding an audition at some point in time. Can I sit in on that? Absolutely. Sweet. Absolutely. I need a critical guy that's like Simon Cowell. Can you do a Simon Cowell voice? Like, that was terrible. That was terrible. (laughs) Yeah. What was that? (laughs) Yes. That was rubbish, you know. But you have to wear a <laughs> like plain white T-shirt. And anyway, oh, so um, we've got that. Uh, I've got most of the crew figured out, but there will be some crew positions still to fill. And um, if you are looking to get a hold of me or David or Tom, you can find us on Facebook. That's Ducon Williams, David Watson, Thomas Baker. Is it Tom B? Tom, Tom C Baker? Tom, Tom Baker. It's just Tom Baker. Yeah, it's just Tom. There's a lot of those, by the way. Yeah. It, it, find the ugliest one. Yes. And go with that. No, I'm I'm kidding. He's the a dude that has a head that looks like a cabbage. <laughs> he's a very very <laughs> handsome individual. So um, oh, man. and uh, and and one of the things that uh, I'm trying to do is crowdfunding. I'm not good at it, but uh, if that's the area we have to go, that's what we'll do. So but, uh, what are you thinking on, um, like, to do the proof of concepts? Like, if you could put a price tag on it right now, what, are, what, what, what price are you putting I'm, I'm going to probably spend 2500 2500 yeah, on proof shoot, of concept? Yeah, shooting and editing a, a proof of concept. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, cast and crew, they won't get much, but I, I plan to pay them because I'm that kind of a guy. Well, yeah. You know, so um, two or three day shoot. Um, oh, the other thing is, is I am looking for Western looking locations. That's a big one. Uh, yeah. so if, if anybody knows where those are at, please reach out. Um, I'd really like to get the ball rolling on this thing. So, um, any help that you have, I'm grateful for. Thank you. Yeah. It's awesome. Cool. I'm excited, man. Cool. Me too. I'm super too. excited. Well, guys, thank you for being on. This has been once again, it's fun. I love talking to you guys and folks out there. Um, I'm trying to, uh, get my life schedule in order right now. I've had so much stuff going on. Totally loved having you guys here. Thank you for joining me on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Two very talented and awesome individuals. And then we also have the incredible Hulk here today. What's up Hulk? Can you say hi? Oh, now he's, he's quiet. That's that's be a, quiet. That's now that's after I'm quiet. sitting over here all the whole time, Very just looking nice. at him like, better stop. <laughs> I'm about to freak out over here. Uh, Crosby, yeah. the, the the newly crowned seven year old Hulk, yeah. has a very nice smile. He does. So <laughs> handsome. Crosby was actually our producer today. He, he was. was just kind of keeping us in line, and yep. he kept kind of thank you, Crosby. He kept kind of signaling me like Tom, time to cut it off. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. And guys, it's been great having you on the show. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. You have been listening to the Bravo Creative Podcast. Analysis of your biometrics have been compiled and calculated. You are now a minuscule part of the collective. Enjoy the rest of your pitiful day.